Now, in this true spirit of disruption, genuine spirit of disruption, I'd like you all to put aside your things and stand up, please. Stand up. <coughs> Whoops. I'd like to introduce you to a new exercise this morning. It's called the Boxing Kangaroo. And for those of you who haven't been to Australia or don't know much about Australian history, men used to fight kangaroos. They used to put gloves on them, just like that. So we're going to do the Boxing Kangaroo exercise. I know you're going to love this. Duke's out in front, bending knees. Push them forward. Come on, this is half. Push. Now. In between, the kangaroo balances itself on its tail, so it goes. <laughs> now we're into it. Now stop there. Now, when the dukes go, boom! Boom! I want you to do that. I want you to voice it. Ready? Boom! Boom! Right Righto, ready? Here we go. Boom! 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 Now, when, uh, when, the kangaroo, when the kangaroo hops up to get gum leaves, in kangaroo speak, hopping is gum gum. Ready? Boom! Boom! Gum gum! Boom! Boom! Gum gum! Boom! Boom! Gum gum! Boom! Boom! Gum gum! That's enough. That's enough. Well done, Patrick. Give Patrick a hand. He was very good at that. <laughs> 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 now your brains. Oxyviva, please. You've got those heart pumpers. Now, um, exercise turns us on. It really pumps us. What I want to do today is just open another window for you in the whole world of human movement human motion. I've called today's session the unrealised value of human motion, moving back to movement. I'm a physical educator. I've been one for 50 years. I love it. I'm proud to be a physical educator. Over that time, however, I have been angered, frustrated, puzzled, bemused that we're not supported more for what we do. I know Patrick's words this morning were genuinely felt, but I want to take that further. Patrick, I want us to go further, and really I want to unfold to you the paradigm that is unfolding around us that we have to open our eyes to, because it's supporting us more and more in the world of human motion. And for those who think that schools should reduce the time for physical education and increase the time for academics, Nothing could be further from the truth. The research is showing us now. Nothing could be further from the truth. So I want us to actually hone in on what it is that brings human motion and should bring us up to a really powerful situation. Why did the chicken cross the road? It's a paradigm that's been around for many, many years. Why did the chicken cross the road? It depends on your paradigm, how you interpret and understand the world around you to answer that question. Now, how you, the, vet, the lens you look through to actually to see the world around you. <laughs> the chicken crossed the road. There is no, no dispute. Stay. At the Fourth World Congress of the Chicken Crossing the Road, held in Kentucky, the Poultry Hall of Fame, <laughs> you're laughing, this is true. This happens. There was a group of scholars who came together to ask the question, why the chicken crossed the road? And thrown up in some of the 
reasons why it crossed the road was that it's suicidal, it wanted to be hit by a car. Aliens put a plate in its head and directed it should do so. KFC was on the same side, so it was going the other side. <laughs> they asked Plato, and Plato said, oh, he crossed the road for the common good. They asked Richard Nixon, and he said, the chicken did not cross. Repeat, the chicken did not cross the road. Albert Einstein said, whether the chicken crossed the road or the road crossed underneath the chicken depends on your frame of reference. I, Albert, uh, sorry, Isaac Newton, the man of motion that we should all know about, the forces of motion, said, of course, with, um, every chicken in motion will stay in motion unless an external force acts on it. <laughs> Different lenses. But there was a lot of alternative theories. And one of them was the big great wolf chased the small little animal through the barren park and it just missed it by a couple of centimetres in a huge lunge. And the chicken fled through a bush and came out the other side and found itself on the edge of a road. And when it was on the edge of the road, it turned around and with big decisions here, am I going to go across this road or am I going to face the big wolf? No, no decision needed. It turned and fled across the tarmac. That's why it crossed the road. The human motion paradigm, okay, no. I know you're all getting boggled by them. The human motion paradigm is a set of concepts and ideas held by a community of professionals, including physical educators and scholars, including researchers about human motion. There is no question that comes out of the mouths of our education leaders that motion is important to the development of our, and the education of our children. There is no question. It's in their minds. They know it. The big question that we're not good at is why? Whoops. Where are we? Hello? You know? Sorry about this. The question is why? Why are we not good at explaining why physical education is so important? And I'm so pleased to be, thank you, I'm so pleased to be here today and to be asked, and thank you, Brad, and your committee for working hard and asking me to be here, because I want to outline the paradigm, the human motion paradigm that is growing around us, and I want to help you with your own paradigm interpret that. Because by doing that, I believe you're going to be able to better put your case for increasing for more time in the curriculum, for more money in the budget. You're going to be able to talk to parents more about the value of what you do and bring it over clearly. There are people running up to support us, and yet we're still here, locked in this little world. I want to open that up. It's called a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is happening to us right now. And unlighting that paradigm shift, I want to bring to you some of the areas that are traditional in our, the traditional disciplines that support us and we need to revisit and say, hey, that was pretty good. Why aren't we talking about that still? And also new areas that are coming to support us that are, that are actually very powerful and compelling. One of the areas is the influence of human motion on the neural system on our brain functioning. If ever there was an area that is now supporting you to do what you're doing, that is it. So let me take you down that path today. <clears throat> I want to do it because I think what you do and what I was doing in my previous life, I'm retired now, I'm 70, I'm retired but I, I still love physical education. But we were attacked by mind-body dualism for millennia. And that says that the mind is more important than the body. In fact, there were, there were church leaders, there were politicians, there were great philosophers who argued that the body, only thing the body did was carry the head around. 
and you could change heads on bodies. You look at some schools in the times gone by and all the kids needed to walk through the gate was their heads because nobody worried about their bodies. And you might still see it now. It still lingers. So it's called mind-body dualism and it was that, that particular conceptualisation was that the mind was separate from the body. And it started right along in the Greek, even the Greek writings and has been going for years. Sol Ross, the great Canadian philosopher, recently departed, wrote, I don't know why this is going blank. Blank. Oh, that one. Place that one. Oh, IT, you see. This is IT. Um, Sol Ross said the mind that's the component that thinks is valued over the body, the non-thinking thing. Since physical educators supposedly deal with the body, the non-thinking component, they and their subject are relegated to lower areas in the institutions. How many years did that go on? A lot of people thought of that and of course And of course, <laughs> we actually got people actually doing it and, and accepting it over the many, many years. One of the things that is happening and has happened is that that particular conceptualisation of mind-body dualism has been rebutted by more and more researchers in the last two decades than ever, ever before. And I did in my, my PhD dissertation I travelled the world to find out why physical education wasn't acknowledged more, why people didn't acknowledge more human movement in the development of people. I met people everywhere. George Lakoff at Burley, uh, at Berkeley, Peter Salovey at Yale, and on it goes. All of these people were very, very adamant. George Lakoff wrote Philosophy in the Flesh. If any of you have not read that book, and you want to have a paradigm shift, read that book, Philosophy of the Flesh. It's a book that talks about how we develop as humans all come through what we do as our body. And they dispute, and they have been rebutting the mind-body dualism for the last two decades, which has been very powerful for us. So I'd like you to know that. Our sense of what is real begins and depends crucially on our bodies, what is real. Especially our sensory motor apparatus, which enables us to perceive, move and manipulate and the detailed structure of our brains which have been both shaped by our experience and our culture. Lakoff and Johnson were fantastic men to meet. So what is going on here? It is that we have to grasp really the basis of why human motion is really important. We start with human motion, it kick starts us, all of the great philosophers say without motion there is no life. How absolutely true that is. Without motion there is no life. So we start our life kick-starting. We go through a motion. Some people follow a path that is absolutely full of motion in their lives. Others don't. And we end up dying without motion. The circle of life. Nothing could be more absolute and truth than that. Motion starts us, motion finishes us. Human motion is embedded in our DNA. In fact, our very first primitive reflexes are motion, they're movement, they're reflexes. Nothing could be more poignant than to show you that little Samuel R. Mass who was in his mummy's womb. He had spina bifida. They pulled mummy's womb out, put it on the side and started to operate to get in and, and see if they could do something. And the little grasping reflex came out and grabbed him. It's called the hand of hope. Nothing right from the start. Motion kick-started. We're postulated. We live as long as any animals, as much as anyone else wants to dispute it. We actually live and are programmed to live as long as any other animals. Some people don't know that. The oldest recorded um, person is Madame Marie Calment. She was 122 when she signed off. 122. This man, this lady, was riding a bike around the southern suburbs of Paris at 100. She was riding her bike. 
Have you ever seen a person 100 riding a bike? <laughs> I've seen a few lately doing the 100 metre dash. She's our oldest recorded person. By the way, the oldest recorded people, un, sort of oldest unrecorded people, are in the island of Iwo Jima, where it's very hilly and there are some people who are reputed to be 150 years old. Can't prove it. But she, we can prove her. Had her 115th birthday, she sat around with a cigar and a bottle of, and a glass of scotch with her 95 year old children. <laughs> what a photo. The Human Genome Project, which I was, had the pleasure of visiting on my little sojourn, ticks us off at being able to live 125 years. We don't make it. Why is that? We don't make 125 years. In Australia, for example, the uh, male is expected to live 80 years and the females, God damn them, they're going to they're outlive us, 84. <laughs> I remind my wife of that, so you treat me well. I'm going early, right? You treat me well. <laughs> so, so we have a culture, a culture of sickness rather than fitness. A culture of sickness. And there's great debate right now. Stop it, Patrick. There's great debate right now about whether the younger generations of our time now are going to actually make what we make because they're not going to be robust enough. Unless somebody comes along with a, with a miracle drug that's going to kick them on, on their, their physical structures are not going to be as anywhere near robust as yours if we keep going the way we're going now. And people are putting up the warning signs right now that our children are too much sitting and not enough moving. Not like we were, and I'm, this is really going to sound bad, but not like I was when I grew up, and I'm sure most of you. So I want to now move into um, the traditional areas that we are taking for granted. And this is that human motion actually is really fundamental in the process of human development. And human development we're showing now, and is being now shown, to go right across the lifespan, movement, human motion is crucially important. Now I know that because I'm up here. And I see a lot of my friends old before their time. I see them have checked out of movement and they're in their homes and I say to them, what are you doing? I see them like this. What are you doing? The same age as me. Get up, move. That's what you're built for. However, the process of development is three inter interacting. Now, I've become a human developmentalist as much as a phys over my last 20 years. As a human developmentalist, those who don't know it, is new, a new discipline that talks about the development of humans across their total lifespan. And my particular interest is, and I speak about it everywhere, is the role of motion in that, in that development across the lifespan. And nothing is now showing more important than the role of motion up in here, at the start of our life and at the end of our life and really, quite crucially, in the middle of our life when the most stress is. Human motion is a major process of our lifespan development and functioning. I just want to quickly clarify what it is. Human motion is that pattern of change that starts at, our, at conception and goes through at the lifespan. It involves growth early and decline later in the lifespan. No, nothing new there. But learning enables us to grow and change. Learning. The only way you change is by learning. Your, your system learns something new, therefore you act differently. You learn. Human functioning, which is another area traditionally we've meant to be checking into, we're getting your body moving well. Human functioning is our body's biological systems that carry out specific functions necessary for everyday living. And also, in a cu cultural context, it's our patterns of behaviour, our functioning within the society that we exist and the roles we play in that. Those two things are very crucial and movement is absolutely essential in that process. So human development across the lifespan is a complex process interacting between cognitive, 
development, which is the development of our language and our brains, the biological processes, which is the development of our body, our movement, our heart size, our brain size, and our nutrition, and socio-emotional processes is our interactions with others and our relationships we form. Now, human development is right across the globe accept that and work with that. That there is a complex relationship there and fundamentally human motion plays a really, really crucial part in that, which we don't ring the bell enough. You see a lot of schools say we develop students. This is what we're talking about. Here, these were two twins, identical at birth, just to make a point. The little girl stayed in South America, Latin America. Her parents, both her parents were shot. She stayed and she stayed with her uncle and auntie. This little girl here went to California. She was adopted out. Two identical twins at birth, have a look. Those processes at work. So we, the complex relationship between those three things as we develop come, boils down to motion, emotion and cognition. These were the things I found when I travelled the globe with my, on my little sojourn, my odyssey, to find the answer. I'm not saying I found it, but I'm going to bring you along. You know yourself. When you let one of those three things go, the biologic or the socio-emotional or the cognitive, if you get too stressed, it takes over the other two. So a balance occurs. And one of the most important balances in human development is that the more you start moving, the better you'll be. And of course, when, one of the get, when they get out of work, you lose focus in life, you start getting diseases, you start getting conditions, relationships break down, and, and you start getting cancers and diabetes and all the other lifestyle things that come in when that balance breaks down. And I mean when it breaks down. You see around you, your colleagues, people who are stressed and so on, they start to go through this path and they get back onto the path of salvation by actually moving again. How many people have asked me to go and talk to the Black Dog Society or the, the depressed people or people with dementia? And I start talking about that and I go, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, get up and do it. No one's stopping you. And so you start the journey. Now, to develop, as I said before, requires learning. And learning comes through, really, learning comes through our senses. That's the only way we learn. We have seven major senses. We have hearing, sight, touch, smell, taste, proprioception, which you all know about, should know, and balance, vestibular system. They're the seven main senses that receive information. We also have a host of others, of course. There's the pulmonary stretch receptors, there's the chemoreceptors, esophageal receptors, and temperature receptors in our body. All those things bring information from the outside world into us. So the world, they're our scouts. The senses are our scouts. I'm looking at you now and I'm saying, oh, well, you're giving me information right now and, I'm, and the same for you. So physical movement, one of the interesting things is that physical movement hits all of those senses at the same time. No other learning area does that. We hit all those senses at the same time because of movement. There's hearing, there's sight, there's sound, there's, there's taste even, there's smell. And so we actually take and react on, those, on that information. Now that, those sensors bring information into the brain so they can decide what to do next. And the black box is gone, folks. Don't even ever talk about black boxes anymore. Information in black box inf res re um, response, gone. That was thrown out 20 years ago, plus. Well, here we go again. So when we move, we actually stimulate our moving, our senses. We stimulate the information coming into our bodies. It's called the moving cognition cycle. One of my great colleagues, Jill Connell, from a New Zealander, she goes around the world talking to people. She's a physical educator just like me, pretty boring. She's boring, no. She gets around the world talking about 
A moving child is a learning child. She's influenced so many schools to change their mode of operation. Patrick, you're listening, I know. They're changing so much about how they operate. So the senses both motivate, you move and you get information in, you get information and you move. It's a, it's a quarter reaction. A baby sees an apple, grabs it, right? It sees it first, then grabs it. So that information came out to stimulate it to move. I want to now just quickly touch on human functioning. I'll come back to that learning cycle in a minute. You're going to be, hopefully, I'm going to bring you back to that. The chook will make sure I do. But human motion and human functioning. Do you know that when you move, every organ in your body is impacted? Every organ in your body is impacted. Blood flushes through with nutrients. You remove waste of metabolism. Your organs are bathed in hormones and other chemicals. And the elevation of activation and function of all the body systems, all the organs in the body, means you've got a high level of activation, therefore you've got a higher level of health. You're actually operating at a higher level. One system, that body ecosystem that you've got, is actually pumping around and being in balance. Now we don't talk about that enough, but it is really crucially important if you want to talk about health, that we actually need to stimulate all of the systems of the body. I want to hone in on two particular systems, and that's the cardiovascular system, which is to do with pumping blood around your body, and the cardiorespiratory system, which is to do with grabbing air and putting it out to the cells of your body. Those two, those two systems are so crucial and we take them for granted. They're there within us and we don't know how important they are. Just ask people on the slab because they see the cardiovascular system isn't working. Ask people who don't get enough oxygen and they die. Sorry, you can't ask them. <laughs> so, now, this higher level of activation with with all these systems in the body impacted by motion, is fundamental to us. That's one of the reasons why we go out and you know, people used to run the children around. You give them a break, they've been sitting down, go let them run around. And, you know. No, it's more important than that. These, these organs and systems need to be hit all the time. They need to be worked. The heart itself is like your muscles. If you don't work it, don't, you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use and work those organs, they, you'll lose their functioning. Now, I want to turn to a huge area of development in human functioning. Brain science has come in the last uh, in the, year, the decade 1990 to 2000, that 10 years, there was more brain science, more work and research done on the brain than ever before. And it was called the decade of the brain. The decade of the brain. And what, they, what people were doing, the neuroscientists were studying the physiology of the, of the nervous system, the, cell, the, ner the neurons and the brain itself, and the cognitive scientists were working out how different bits of information were circulated in the brain. And let me tell you something. I, I was brought up thinking you've got a left side brain and a right side brain. Who, put your hand up if you thought that. You're born that. Left side and right side brain. Nothing. Do you know people have had one side of the brain with a bullet, straight through, got rid of one side, the other side takes over and just does the same things, if they survive. Your brain takes over all functions everywhere within the brain. What we're going to see more of, and what you're going to see more of, is doing brain research and, and movement is very expensive. The good stuff is very expensive. Now, I'm talking about MRIs, CAT scans, PET scans, where we actually do something and see what happens with the brain. Now, the reason why there's not enough research right out now, though that's not true, there is research out now, is because it's expensive. And the more and more we start talking like I'm talking now and getting convincing people to put us a few dollars, we'll go and do this with students, we'll show you. We'll show you why your kids should be actually on a treadmill before they do a test. We'll show you. 
This is what the leading developmental psychologists and neuroscientists are finding out, that motion functions the brain to work at its best. This is a fellow called John Ratey who was leading, hands up if you've heard of John Ratey. Good, excellent, excellent. This guy is going around the world, I know him very well. We all know that exercise makes us feel better, but most of us have no idea why. We assume it's because we're burning off stress, reducing muscle tension, or boosting endorphins, and we leave it at that. The real reason we feel good when we get our blood pumping is that the brain make, it makes the brain function at its best. In my view, in Ratey's view, the benefit of physical activity is far more important, this benefit, than, and fascinating than what it does for the body. That's his opinion. And I believe I'm, I'm there too, because I've been doing the other for years. The brain itself is an intense psychochemical activity. The brain it takes up 2% of your body mass, and yet it uses a minimum of 20% of the energy and the oxygen you take in. Think about that. 2% of your body mass uses 20% of the oxygen and the nutrients you take in. Clark did this immense study in 1999, and that astounded people. And when you think about it, you've got children sitting at desks and they're meant to be learning, and all of a sudden, they're not moving enough, they're not getting enough oxygen, they're not getting enough nutrients flushing through, and so we've got this physico-chemical activity happening, decreasing, declining, declining. I want to show you a bit later how schools chuck out the chairs. They don't have chairs anymore in the school, in the, in the classroom. They got rid of them. And the effect they found was fantastic. So the brain doesn't, have, it doesn't supply itself with oxygen and nutrients. The brain relies on the body. It doesn't have its own pump and function. So the cardiovascular system and the cardiorespiratory system are the two systems mainly that actually keep your brain going. They pump it up. They pump the nutrients up around. They refresh. They take out the metabolic waste that occurs just as much in your brain as it occurs anywhere else. Your brain's got to get rid of the waste. I don't know what's happened there. I'm doing it, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Where's my man? <laughs> You're a good man. <laughs> Can you see that this is where your paradigm is starting to, the human motion paradigm is starting to broaden? You can see where now there's people standing up alongside us, the neuroscientists, the cognitive scientists, are extending our paradigm, our human motion paradigm. So the brain requires the rest of the body to give it its nutrients. And when we move, would you believe the first organ in the body that, that gains the benefit is the brain? It's the first organ that benefits from you moving, is the brain. Clearly, oxygen and glucose are pumped in. It's got to have energy. Don't forget, it's using up 20%. Neurogenesis. Now, we, I thought, what was neurogenesis? What are they talking about? We actually grow brain cells. We actually develop new neurons in the hippocampus. We actually grow cells. We don't get rid of them. We, actually, in the early years, we prune out, yes, but as we go in our life, we grow more. And motion stimulates it because the brain has to grow cells to take in the new information. Dendritic branching. For those of us, and all you have done human anatomy and human physiology, which is a must in my view for physical education teachers, you must know the body. You must know what you're talking about. The dendritic branches that go at the end of the neurons, the dendrites, they actually increase in number. The more information coming in, they start to spread more. So you've got better interconnectivity between the neurons. Therefore, you've got more chance, if you get a challenge, to make solutions. So you actually increase the connectivity and the brain functioning ability by moving, by dendritic branching, increasing. This is the part that a lot of people traditionally go on, and it's so important, that when you move, 
hormones and chemicals are released in. Serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Now, I'm not going to go into that, but what they do is balance. So when you move, you go from a depressed state, for example, to a healthier, happier state. You actually balance. By moving, these things are secreted in, and the neurotransmitters actually balance your brain. And if you, don't want, to, if you want to know that, take your kids, if you've got a class, take them out, run around the oval, come back, and they're smiling. They're more balanced. They're actually happy. And now, most importantly, this has just come up recently, that the moving increases the, uh, evokes the increase of BDNF. And BDNF is called, I'm not going to tell you, say its big name, is the molecule, is the molecules that come down, that cascade down, it's called the miracle grow of the brain that actually protects the neuron cell wall and protects the nucleus and protects all the materials in it. So BDNF is so crucial to brain health and the only thing that, listen, the only thing that stimulates its release is motion. In itself, a huge reason why you would be going around and, and saying motion is essential for everybody, right across your life, for that particular protection of your brain. Again, John Ratey, pioneer in the field. If you don't believe me again, this was Hillman and Castelli, quite a famous now. It's been done to death, I know. I'm sorry for those who have seen this. But this was a class of 20 students, 20 year fours, and they were going to take a cognitive test. And so they, before the, these kids sat before the test, and you can see straight away that uh, the green section, there's no red section, there's no activation. These kids here got on the treadmill for 20 minutes before the test, sat down and did it, doubled the score of the kids sitting. So the children in your room can actually increase their academic output. They were better prepared for learning and, prefer and had better results. Now we did a survey, a project in South Australia which was called the SHAPE project, the Schools, and Health, Schools Health and Physical Exercise project and we found that in one term, by the children doing an hour a day, an hour a day, whoops, that, the, that their academic scores increased. And particularly those, that, classes, that class that actually increased their fitness. And there were ten schools in this, eight schools in this. And those eight schools all showed us right across that the fitter the children, the better their academic res their response was. The better they behaved, the less truancy, the less bullying, hey, these are all things that are rising, aren't they? And the less depressive activity in the class. Happier kids. This guy here was our Director General of Education. Here he was, rolling up the sleeves, coming and dancing with the kids. What a great example. Can you find any of them anywhere now in the education departments? Have a look. Very important. Another piece of research Another piece of information is adding to your paradigm is that the human brain is plastic. We're not born with a fixed hard wired, we are soft wired. I met this man, Michael Merzenek, he's called the father of brain plasticity. One of his students was Norman Doig. And Norman Doig was the brain, wrote the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. He was one of his students. This guy was actually the fellow who pioneered the idea that your brains are plastic. We're in the early stages, and this is him in 2011, just only a few years ago. We're in the early stages of a brain plasticity revolution. That revolution begins with a clear understanding that the brain's machinery is being constantly rewired and functionally revised, not set, and substantially under your control through the course of your natural life. Now that made a huge impact to people. Old dogs can learn new tricks. I don't go too well with IT, but old dogs know new tricks. So he felt so strongly about the movement aspect, because he, he and I talked for hours about it. He felt so strongly that he devised a movement regime to enhance the brain plasticity that goes on. Move as you fo and move, focus on the feeling and the flow of that movement. Move with your whole body. 
Rigorously avoid stereotypic movements. Don't get him on the gym where people go and do the same thing every night. Same weights, same routine, don't get him on that. Stereotypic movements are really poison for your brain, by the way. Include postural variations and weights. Monitor the quality and precision of your movement. Set a goal for the mastery of all movements as wide a range as possible. Sorry. Now, to me, that looks like a pretty good outcome of a PE lesson, a PE program. Pretty good outcomes. If you stuck to those, you'd have a fantastic phys ed program, a fantastic program at your school. You don't have to call it phys ed, program at your school. Another one of his colleagues, John Arden, is a, uh, another um, neuroscientist going around the world preaching like we're doing. And by the way, um, the uh, Institute, Cooper Institute in Texas, surveyed two million children in Dallas. And the children were doing the fitness gram. You've all probably heard of the fitness gram. Two million of them over one year. Results, the fitter the child, the better the academics. Simple. Healthier child, less behavioural problems at school, happier people. Two million of them. Pretty hard to dispute. Motion benefits the brain first. And this guy is so pumped about this that he goes around the world talking about it. You'll hear him soon. But he's also a brain plasticity man and he knows that and he wants to talk about the brain changing. So physical exercise and learning work together and stimulate neurogenesis. New cells are stimulated because you move and learn. The best exercise, therefore, combines cardiovascular boost and learning a new skill. A cardiovascular aspect and learning a new skill. Variety. Novelty. Think about your programs. Are they dull and boring to the kids? He had such an influence on the Californian Education Department that they changed and actually concentrated on fitness programs for their children in their schools. And they found right through California, this is a big area, right through California, that the increasing level of fitness produced higher academic scores. They could prove it. They showed it. Listen, you're getting more stuff now coming into your paradigm. He was the director of training at the Mental Health for Kaiser Permanente, a very, very prestigious area and area of action for him. Okay, I see some of you nodding off. Up you get, please. Just put your things aside. Can you do this? You know this one. Up you go. Come on, we need to just stretch. Right, go to your left, just to your left. Stay there, stay there. Lean to the front and to your right. One more time, front, left. Hold it. Front and right. Right, going right. On time. Yeah. Okay. And sit down. Come up and tell me. We've got about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fly. If we want to talk about health and health education, the, these are the 20 top killers in Australia, and they've been that way for since 2003 and before, before that, the top 20 killers are heart disease, stroke. We go down the list, lung cancers, we go down to diabetes, and we right down into um, dementia and depression. I did one for you in Hong Kong here, and the 10 top killers in Hong Kong are, first of all, cancers, pneumonia, heart disease, whoops, heart disease, external causes, which is uh, morbidity, which is uh, people taking their own lives, people poisoning, accidentally poisoning, and right down through to diabetes. You have a very strong strategy here in Hong Kong. I've read your, your Hong Kong department, health department's papers, and they talk about, unfortunately, activities, um, risk factors such as unhealthy diets, physical activity and tobacco 
of what they want to hear. So if you want support for your actions in your school, no, no, look no further than your own backyard. The oncologist is now saying that regular exercise is associated with decreased cancer risk. How strong is that? These are oncologists. These are not the guys who are just GPs. These are the people out there who are saying, by moving more, you decrease the risk of cancers and sitting. So the big ones you're going to get, we get thrown at us for some reason. They're trivial. You know, the plastic wa uh, water bottles, the sugar, the deodorants, and the radiation. Forget rid of them. The ones that really kill you are the smoking, obesity, alcohol, and the sun. And the same with diabetes. First line of defence, weight, diet and exercise. These are, these are now common around the globe. Workplaces are finding getting people more active gets them healthier and more productive. So the popular press is now going and saying get rid of the desks at work. Have standing desks. People are pumped up, they're doing all sorts of things in their workplace. It's now starting to hit home. How much of this have you got in your workplace? We, the report card for children in, our, in, South, in Australia has been, is very bad. Have a look at this. Set on behaviour is D minus. Active play, inconclusive. Overall physical fitness, uh, physical activity levels, D minus. Organised sport, yes, B minus. They ask the question, is sport enough? And of course the answer is, with the amount of obesity, with the amount of screen time, sport is not enough. Where we find, where examples of uh, those places where have put more physical activity in their school time and reduced their academic time, Vaughan was a fantastic experiment that showed us, that showed that, um, I don't know what's going on here, that uh, by taking, the, in Vaughan, the experiment was that the kids did two hours of physical education or physical activities, dancing, games, sports every day, and they found up went the academic results. The discipline problems were re reduced and uh, the kids were coming to school much happier. We're finding in, in Australia that junior primary children are being um, put on suspensions from school. Junior primaries. So now they're starting to incorporate into their programs more activities to make the to balance and to make the children healthier. Studies of increased utilisation, I, I will be unwinding these in my workshop, but uh, the worldwide meta-analyses, and these are analyses done of um, studies done all over the globe, are showing us that you cannot, school boards, school administrators and principals can feel confident that maintaining or increasing the time dedicated to physical education during the day will not have a negative impact on their academic performance and may possibly impact the student's um, behaviour. Now, thousands now of studies worldwide are coming up with that. If you want it proof, here they are. We can get them to you. A school in Charleston were doing maths while they are doing activity and of course they found the kids doing maths, their times tables, their skip jumping and then so on, skip counting, all went up. While they were doing maths, up went their scores, putting motion straight into that learning area. And here we go, they're called kinesthetic furniture. The kids don't, they don't have uh, chairs. We're finding that the impact has been so great. These are what they call standing kinesthetic school equipment. And chairs where they sit and do their motions. People have got rid of uh, chairs and got uh, stability balls and they're finding the bouncing increases spatial awareness. I won't talk about this, but it's a new way of describing it. It's called human capital. And human capital, intellectually, financially, physically, emotionally, and socially, is another way to help us explain the value, the underestimated value of human motion. So, we have a broader and stronger paradigm. We have learning about, we need to go back to our mantra, learning about, learning of as much activity as possible, and the skills in building our physical literacy, learning about the influence of motion on our health and systems, building our health literacy and learning through motion to develop our selves, building our human capital. So what's all this translating to? Translates into daily physical education, 
translates into as much movement in the classroom as possible, academic, active academics it's called, and movement breaks, ample opportunity to play sports and supportive communities. Now is the time to recruit and have all those disciplines around us that are building our paradigm. So, last thing. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, the chicken knew, <laughs> if I find my papers, <laughs> I can't read. So with the chicken's new understanding and interpretation of the world, it knew that it was acting on compelling evidence that had come about from all those disciplines that were supporting. And it knew that by moving, it was developing into great chickenhood across its lifespan. It knew by moving that physiologically it was giving itself the best shot to be as healthy as it can be over its lifespan, right over. And it knew that it was a better learner and learning better at every stage of its lifespan. It was smarter by, by moving. It was not going to be pushed around. Moving. It knew that by moving back to moving, moving back to movement, planned intentional movement that was, it would benefit its life and its education and its life. It was one of the most important changes in education for new time. It knew it was part of that. So in the end, the chicken was in an unarguable position. It had to cross the road. <laughs>